Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome back to the second part of The World This Week where our panel of journalists here in the studio chew the fat on what's been making news this week. And with me is uh, Vivian Walt, contributor to Time magazine, Christopher Dickey, a frequent guest here at France 24 and foreign editor, of course, at The Daily Beast, Regis Le Sommier, deputy editor at Paris Match and Paul Nolan, who works for the website True Click. Now, another country all too familiar with political pundits getting it wrong is Israel. Nearly two months after an election, the country's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, stitched up a last-minute deal to form a coalition government with the far-right Jewish Home Party. The new coalition of conservative and religious parties is more ideologically coherent than the previous one, yet with a single-seat majority in Parliament and the say, it will have trouble tackling the country's domestic and international challenges and perhaps even passing a budget. I'm sure no one is surprised that these negotiations were lengthy. No one is surprised that they ended by the deadline, on time. We have a lot of work ahead of us. I suggest that we get to work. Good luck to all of us and the people of Israel. Congratulations. Israel now has a government. This is not a government for right-wingers or left-wingers or centrists. This is the government of all the people of Israel. This evening I had a very good conversation with the Prime Minister during which I told him that the Jewish home will join a national government under his leadership. Christopher Dickey, this bodes far from well for any resumption of Palestinian peace talks. Well, that's right. I mean, I think we'll have to see if they start to stumble over domestic issues in Israel because those are the issues that really Israelis care about. I mean, if they can't pass a budget, that could be fatal for this government. As far as the peace, peace process is concerned, though, that's what the international community cares about, and that's just not going to happen. That's going to go absolutely nowhere with this government. Uh, I don't think we can, we can listen to those people who say, oh, well, the farther right the government is, the better it is, because they can make the deal. Uh, look, at, uh, look at Menachem Begin uh, and Camp David. Things don't work that way anymore. The fact is, Netanyahu has never wanted to make peace in the terms that were laid out in the frameworks of the international community and the United States was pushing, and now he'll say he can't make peace that way, so there is going to be no peace uh, along the lines of a two-state solution. Vivian, uh, it appears a two-state solution, as Christopher was just saying there, is going to become a distant dream. Well, I mean, actually, the, the only thing I, I think that can be said for Netanyahu was his blunt honesty before the uh, election, where Which he, he reneged on, by the way, which is partly reneged on after Right, the exactly. Election. But he went on TV and, in a moment of, you know, rare moment of honesty, said uh, he was not interested in a Palestinian state. So I would say, totally agree with Chris. Um, absolutely no progress on that front. Um, but for most Israelis, what's really troubling them, and this has really bubbled up repeatedly over the last. Um, year or so, the cost of living, the the quality of life is just, you know, degrading almost, you know, steadily by the year, by the month. Um, and one only needs to visit Israel, and I know you know the country very well, um, to feel how expensive it is and how really it's sort of become a very economically divided country um, that's leaving aside the divisions between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis. Uh, Regis, as uh, Vivian was just saying, you know, it's not just the challenges confronting the Palestinians, it's the internal challenges as well, and including particularly religious reforms, which the government under this uh, new coalition will start rolling back to appease their more religious partners. That's right, and, and, and there's also um, other reasons to worry. I mean, the uh, far-right party that uh, Netanyahu found a, a, a convenient alliance with uh, has made some outrageous statement. I mean, there was one woman who said that uh, the almost calling for genocide of Palestinians, saying that uh, the women, uh, the, the the mother of uh, the Palestinians should be slaughtered, and it's, you know, all sorts of you know very very tough words, and and I think that's that are not helpful. There's also we've be, we've seen number of social unrest in, in, in Israel and also racial unrest. I mean, recently there, were, uh, there was the, the, the uh, outburst about the treatment of uh, Ethiopian, Jewish Ethiopian in the Israeli community. All of this, is, is that government 
um, really up to the task to dealing with all the, all of this issue. They, you know, they they may be happy tonight because they find a, a way to form a government, but you know, there's a lot of there's a lot to be seen, and I think the both you know the Israeli are going to be watching this, and also the international community. Paul, the situation in Israel, where pollsters and pundits alike were predicting, you know, a, a close. Call, not so much a close call, but uh, they were sort of saying that, if anything, the opposition was going to get in, and then that turned out to be uh, not the case. Is this the case, as we're seeing both in the UK and Israel, a sort of a situation of wishful thinking? Wishful thinking. Um, well, um, getting back to it, I mean, the, the UK um, elections, um, wish, wish, wishful thinking. Um, well, uh, well, hold on. Um, I, I Chris, you're stumped. Here, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm stumped on that one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it's wishful thinking, no. I think that in terms, in, when you look at uh, Israel, it's a different kind of dynamic. Um, in Israel, Netanyahu really started playing the fear card in the last days of the election. Basically said, it's Armageddon if you don't vote me in. The... the um, my opponents are going to give the country away, give it, give it away to the Arabs. The Arabs are voting for them. Uh, it was really extremely ugly, but it worked. It worked. And I think that's what we've seen with Netanyahu again and again and again. He's able to exploit very ugly situations to keep, put himself in power and keep himself in power. And I, I personally never forget that it was the assassination of Yitzhak Rabin that opened the way for Netanyahu to take power the first time. Uh, and that was a, also a situation where there was horrific fear-mongering by him and his party uh, and that directly contributed to the murder of Rabin. So I think I'm not, you know, I think that he's a very canny pol politician, but he plays the fear card especially well. And that's what he did this time. Paul, where does this leave the international community? Because there's no doubt that this far-right coalition government is, seems to almost be thumbing its nose at the rest of the world. Well, it's not going to help the coalition at all, uh, moving towards the right. I mean, um, Netanyahu has already had problems getting on with uh, Barack Obama, um, and also uh, its relations with uh, the EU aren't great. So uh, it looks like it's going to be a worsening of relations uh, with, with uh, the international community. Um, Vivian, and with Washington set to become increasingly obsessed with the upcoming presidential election, I imagine it's sort of going to be very hard to sort of apply leverage on Israel at this point in time. Yes. I mean, you know, Hillary Clinton obviously has been very vocally supportive of Israel for many, many years. Um, however, it's clear this is not the Democrats' man by any manner of means. Um, and Bill Clinton campaigned against Netanyahu in 1996. Right, exactly. I mean, and, and actually, I, I mean, I know Chris was saying Netanyahu is a canny politician. To me, increasingly, he has seemed e exceedingly opportunistic, almost to a fault, a, truly cynical. Um, it, it's just sort of you know, vote for me I, I, almost at the expense of the country's best interests. Um, really, it see, he has seemed sort of blindly interested in his own political survival beyond anything else. Um, and it just seems that that's a fragile foundation on which to build a government. Um, hard to see that this is going to last a whole long time, this coalition. And where is Avidor Lieberman was sort of seen as the sort of bogeyman, if you like, of Israeli politics? He's sort of been overtaken by Naftali Bennett, hasn't he somewhat, Regis? Well, he's um, no, nowhere to be seen. I mean, he's, uh, um, I don't know where, where uh, his political career, because he's so, he seems to be, he was he was the far right of the far right, and now he seems to be, you know, a little carried away, like they, 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 they are yes. so... Uh, so to the far right that it's hard to find him as a, a, a place now. Now, uh, that said, um, given the situation of the whole region also, there's con concern because is Israel, um, what, what, is, what is the intention of Netanyahu at the end of the day? Um, he has to tackle a whole series of problems. I mean, there's turmoil in, Syria, in, in neighboring Syria. There's the question of uh, the Sinai also, with a uh, you know a number of uh, of increasing presence of uh, the Islamic State over there. Uh, there's Lebanon, which is not in good shape. And is Israel going to be this fortress of we, the Israeli people? Is Netanyahu going to pass his, his uh, 
um, uh, proposal of uh, making it like a, a Jewish state, you know, with the exclusion of everybody else, you know, uh, uh, as citizen, which which was, you know, some some of the measure he wanted to take. I mean, there's a lot a lot of stake with with what's gonna ha what's gonna ha take place in the next uh, month and and years, in you know, and and there. You know the way they're going to handle the situation around them. Yeah, although in some ways the so-called Islamic State and all the turmoil around them has given Netanyahu breathing room. Mm. I mean, it can eventually close in on him, but right now all the states that before made it their professional obligation to threaten Israel are disintegrating, and um, in the medium term, that gives him the room to have almost any kind of government he wants in terms of regional politics. Okay, well, moving on, and finally here in France, it's the family feud that keeps on giving. Jean-Marie Le Pen, the founder of the far-right National Front, was suspended from his own party this week after repeating a series of anti-Semitic barbs. Feeling betrayed by Marine Le Pen, his own daughter, who's also party leader, the veteran politician let it fly. No, I never imagined that my daughter could do that, even in my worst nightmares. But I'm only suspended, not expelled. They did not dare go that far. I feel persecuted, but I have even more pain for my supporters of the party. They are like children who see their parents about to divorce. They are shaken, anxious and suffer. I didn't say I don't want her to be elected in the next presidential elections, but if she represents another voice than the one I see as the one that should save the country, it's not very important if it's her or someone else. And Marine Le Pen, who's working frenetically to mainstream the party, had this to say. Jean-Marie Le Pen is free to do what he likes. He's a citizen, and if he wants to create another movement, well, he will. I'm not afraid of any problems. I think that the events which happened were painful, but they were an absolutely necessary and unavoidable clarification. Regis, uh, this uh, feud has been compared to everything from slapstick uh, farce to a Shakespearean tragedy along the lines of King Lear. Yeah, it, it was definitely a, a big, I mean, something totally unexpected, I would say. Um, there was some, um, you know, it started with uh, with that um, uh, interview that Jean-Marie Le Pen gave to uh, Aram, the radio station R RMC, uh, where he stressed that the, the um, uh, Holocaust being a detail point in history was uh, he, he still believed in that, and that started you know creating the buzz, and and then he went further and further and further until he left no room for his daughter and to counterattack and to try to, you know, um, said that this is not the, the political line of the National Front anymore. Um, the problem that lies underneath that is the, the fact that uh, I say um, Jean-Marie Le Pen actually embodies uh, aging politician in the French traditional way. They don't want to give up. Um, it, it's you know, it's very extreme because it's this family feud it is, is new. It's something very unknown, France, when you have a daughter who's taking over the party after her father was the founder. But that's that's rather new. But to see somebody who's 86 years old that don't want to give up, that wants to, see, you know, he's the founder, he doesn't want to let go. That's not uncommon in France. If you see Mitterrand, for instance, left no no heir. Uh, you know, Jospin, you know, Jospin took over what, left, what was left of the Socialist Party and went defeat after defeat. It was, after me, the disaster. That, that's, that's, that's what uh, uh, these men have been saying. And it, it's, it's more of a problem of uh, why don't they want to give up? Why can't they, are they so... You know, and um, you know, believing that they're so important that they. So it's they, a case of old white men. I think it's a it's 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 a can can. Well, let's go uh, easy on old white men. Okay. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I don't think it's a question of race or anything. It's a question of re retaining power and being you know. And um, Jean-Marie Le Pen, on, honestly, is you know could have you know stepped down, you know, stayed in the party like he was, but he didn't want that. He. I. I, I there's also another thing is that. Um, I don't think genuinely Jean-Marie Le Pen wanted to, to be elected president. He, mm. he was a perturbing figure for pretty much the whole 
Fourth Republic and Fifth Republic, he always was this sort of uh, uh, troublemaker. Uh, he was the younger, youngest MP elected in, in, in parliament at one point um, uh, after the Indochina war. And, and he was already somebody, you know, attacking. He, he, th he thrived on that. He, he made his political car career being in opposition. Wants to be president. And she wants to be the president and, she and sees he sees that, that. She thinks that it is possible that she will become president. Mm -hmm. And I think this helps her a lot. I mean, it does. Why, I think there are people who think it was a coup monté, that it's all some kind of artificial... Yeah. Uh, you think so? You, you interviewed I, her recently. I, what do you think? You know, I, I, it did occur to me that this just was so perfect for her that it could have been choreographed by her, not beyond the realm of possibility. She's a very savvy politician. She's an extraordinarily skilled politician. Um, she did, in fact, in my interview with her, say... We will, be with, we will be in power within 10 years. Now, in, I interviewed her actually a year ago, and at the time it sounded completely ludicrous. And in, one year later, it doesn't sound that ludicrous. That she's, she's in for the long haul. She is totally in for the long haul. She has her eyes on the prize. She knows exactly where she's going. And he was an albatross. If you listen to every interview she gives, she never refers to him as my father. She always refers to him as Jean-Marie Le Pen. Well, and, he wants uh, to deny her of her, his name, so... <laughs> what, what's, what's more in particular is that we have uh, the far right here in France and the main figures are Marine Le Pen, Jean-Marie Le Pen, the father, Marion Maréchal Le Pen, the niece, and a husband, I believe, and as Nicolas well. Sarkozy. Well, <laughs> well, it, well, you have the same thing with the Bush in the US. So. And, 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 and they have so much uh, influence in France. And I, I just dynasties. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, I mean, you only have to talk about the Millibands too in the UK. Yeah. Well, true to a certain extent. Yes, the well, father like, and, uh, and the, the, uh, the brothers. Yeah. But do, do you think, Paul, this is becoming a, a problem in terms of attracting voters? This sort of family feud. Well, uh, I think it will probably benefit the uh, FN uh, party because it'll be a chance for Marine Le Pen to say, uh, look, I, I want to get rid of the baggage from the past um, commemorating the Second World War today, but to try and kind of create some distance from, from, that, uh, from its history and, and to try and make a fresh start. Um, but you mentioned 10 years ago, she said she'll be in power. I still think it's a long, long way to, to, for her to actually be uh, President de la République. Well, you know, there was a recent flap uh, where the, lead, the leader of uh, the, the most important Jewish organization here in France said that Marine Le Pen's performance has been impeccable, but there are still a lot of crazy, basically he said, there are still a lot of crazy crypto-Nazis in her party. Mm -hmm. Well, this is perfect, because if Jean-Marie Le Pen creates his own party, especially after making remarks about the Holocaust like that, who does he attract? The crypto-Nazis. Mm -hmm. And that leaves Marine Le Pen looking very good indeed, but, but, still but, but, impeccable. But he's not going to go off quietly in the sunset. No, he's not, but he will look like an irascible old man. And which part he already of, looks like. Which he already looks like. Nobody's going to vote for him. Remember that all of France turned out to vote against him in 2002 when he, by almost by accident, made it into the second round of the presidential elections. That's not going to happen with Marine Le Pen if she makes it into the second well, round. If you look at the polls recent, I mean, I've seen one or two, I think she still has a lead at the first, in the first round, I think she's, it's 29 to 28 to Sarkozy in the first round of the election, the next, in the 2017 election. So I think, as of now, it didn't really have any effect on the number of people intending to vote for her. Well, there was a survey published by The Monde on Wednesday which showed while 69% of respondents believe that the National Front would not be able to manage the country, 67% still agree that there were way too many foreigners in this country. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's obviously she's tapping into something there, isn't she? Yes, she is. And, and you mentioned Marion Maréchal Le Pen. She's, she's pretty high, too. I mean, she's, a, mm -hmm. she's a, like, you, you, you were talking about dynasties, but she's the younger one. She's 25 years old. And for 25 years old to be that high in, the, in, 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 in popularity is ex exceptional. Uh, and Jean-Marie Le Pen's party was a, was a cult of personality. Marine Le Pen's party is not. I mean, what she's really been doing, and people haven't been paying that, uh, enough attention to this, is building a grassroots organization. 
Uh, that's why the European parliamentary elections were important to them, not because they give a damn about what goes on in the European Parliament, but because it was building the structures at a local level Absolutely. that can help them out. Mm -hmm. Same with the municipal elections, building those yep. structures. That's how you become... You, that's how you... If you travel... Uh, I travelled around uh, France with Marine Le Pen during that election for the European Parliament. What was fascinating was that, firstly, she was not associated with the Paris elite, strangely enough, because really she comes out of it. Um, and she went into these little towns where she was building a local base in every little town. And they were not working class people, marginalized people, they were professional middle class people. Well George Bush managed to look to act like a Texan when he was campaigning, and so you it's, know some it's people the skill can have of much the savvy success doing like this, you know. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there at this point. Um, I want to thank my guests. That's Vivian Walt, uh, Christopher Dickey, Regis Le Samier, and Paul Nolan. And it's time now for Media Watch. Welcome back and uh, joining me in the studio is Emma James from our Media Watch desk and Hello. after a dramatic and extraordinary 24 hours, what's been said about the UK election online, Emma? Well, a lot of focus on the fact that it's not just certain politicians that really lost big last night. A lot of people looking at what happened to the pollsters. And uh, The Guardian is one of those asking, how did they get the polls so wrong? Uh, if we take a look at their article, they point out that in Scotland, they were actually fairly accurate. Um, and so what they're wondering, is it a question of people maybe in England and the rest of the United Kingdom who are a little shy or... Passive-aggressive, maybe, maybe. Maybe they downright <laughs> lied about who they were planning to vote for. Or was there a last minute change of heart? Because back in 2010, they did actually predict things pretty accurately then. So this time around, it came as such a shock. Those exit polls came out and the reaction was absolute astonishment. Um, so The Guardian is asking, why did they get it so wrong? Is it to do with the fact that a lot of the polls are done online? So you're only looking at people who are using the internet all the time, a certain demographic. Uh, is it because some of them are done by telephone and it's done by landlines? So of course, again, that's a different demogra demographic, probably a lot older. Um, because you know, the younger generations are, are using their mobiles all the time. So they're looking at the methods and everything, but obviously the fact that those same methods got it right in Scotland, they're wondering why that, that went so wrong. Um, perhaps they should have taken a look at The Economist. They've today uh, kindly tweeted a link to a, an article that they printed back in January where Tony Blair called it as it turned out to be. They got it right, in other words. Tony Blair got it oh, right. Oh, Tony Blair got it right. <laughs> um, elsewhere, people asking about, do we need to change the way that the results actually play out in terms of, if we look at this chart here, which is from the Financial Times, um, they're looking at the number of votes cast versus the number of seats that that's actually won political parties. And in particular, it's UKIP who've done very badly on that front. As you can see from this, they're actually third in terms of number of votes cast, but they only ended up with one seat. And that, in a democracy, doesn't really seem to stack up. Now, Nigel Farage, of course, being one of the main uh, three party leaders who resigned today and uh, who's emerging in the media spotlight as a result. Yes, absolutely. Nigel Farage himself tweeted after the first result came in um, that his party had secured 19.7 of the vote. Um, that's after Labour, ahead of the Conservatives. And as he points out, but of course, we're a protest vote, in inverted commas, um, and basically pointing to the fact that, look, we are a genuine party and people care about what it is that we stand for. Now, of course, elsewhere, the focus is on David Cameron, who tweeted this. This was his sort of victory tweet, if you like. A uh, slightly awkward-looking smooch in a dingy corridor with his was, wife, Sam He's Cam. poking her <laughs> eye out with his <laughs> nose. It <laughs> is very peculiar. Um, but he said, here's to a brighter future for everyone. And, of course, the... Uh, the usual comedians online have come up with <laughs> this, which is my particular favourite. That is, of course, Mr Kim Kardashian, the uh, American rapper Kanye West, cuddled up with the, the British Prime Minister. Uh, now, elsewhere, people are talking about those who are yet to re-emerge from the shadows. David Miliband, of course, the brother of Ed Miliband. Yes, we were talking about him earlier. Absolutely. Yeah. Everyone is now asking, including The Telegraph, where is he? Now, he's currently living in New York um, and... 
the reporters obviously out there in the States went knocking on his door and were told that actually he's gone away. And when they explained they were reporters, uh, apparently his doorman said, that's probably why he's gone <laughs> away. Um, he tweeted on Thursday to everyone to get out and vote and to vote Labour and hashtag Ed for PM. But he's been curiously silent since, so everyone's waiting to see what he says. But as this article points out, um, back in December, he spoke to the Financial Times and they said to him, is there any chance of a return to frontline politics for you? And he said, well, you never know. So that's certainly a possibility. Uh, one of my favourite images that I've seen out there on the Twitter sphere is this one. It's an old image of David Miliband <laughs> coupled with David Miliband is gutted after he hears the news about his brother's defeat. Of course, he's right to look or would be right to look happy because many people see him as having been stabbed in the back by his brother. And I think that's probably at the root of a lot of the unpopularity that his brother has always suffered from because he was seen as having done the dirty on his brother and his brother was really seen as, as the man to take on that top job. So maybe he will be the next one. We shall wait and see. The other big star, Paddy Ashdown's hat. The former Lib Dem leader, when the exit polls came out, said, I don't believe it, this is nonsense, they must be wrong. If it's right, I'll eat my hat. Plenty of people <laughs> talking about that uh, and including this... Uh, Nice little picture here. Bon appétit, Paddy Ashdown. <laughs> Emma James, thank you very much for that. And if I was a British reporter, I'd be checking the passenger lists of all flights heading out to London from New York. That's it for The World This Week. Do stay with us here on France 24 as my colleague will be having more news and headlines after a short break.